All right, we are continuing uh, Roger Talmadge's interview, uh, and we had worked our way through most of your military career now. We had gotten into what I gather was your last assignment. Uh, you were based in Alexandria, Virginia, and you were essentially uh, in charge of the whole set of computers that the Army used uh, on various bases uh, and with individual units around the world. So you're stuck kind of outside of Washington, outside of the Pentagon. Okay. Uh, and you had been developing systems in the last piece of the, the last episode. You were talking about how you had already done a system for the 24th Division that General Norman Schwarzkopf was in charge of down in Georgia. And you had gone back to him and asked, well, can we come back and sort of upgrade or, or, or fix it? And he didn't want anyone to touch anything. We wanted to go to a wartime system and, and, and leave the peacetime system. Mm -hmm. So he, he rebuffed us and threw us out of the office. All right. And, and then uh, somebody that you knew or knew of from your first cavalry days was commanding a division elsewhere, uh, and he agreed to let you come in. So sort of who was that? Where were they? All right. Uh, what General Schwarzkopf did, he, he complained to Washington, D.C. leadership, somebody, I don't know who it is, that, doggone it, he, he's, he's over here, he's a combat zone, I think it was in the 1990s time frame, and one of the, one of the sergeants that's hit here this morning went with uh, the, the, the warrant officer. And uh, so, so what, to res Washington's response was to send some, some ex subject matter, matter experts to uh, the general's uh, headquarters in, in wherever he was in, in, in the war uh, effort in the Middle East. And they gave a briefing on the system generally, and as uh, they got to a point where, okay, fine, and the general information got out, uh, and, and so General Schwarzkopf left. And as he was leaving, his one of his aides uh, had waved to Steve to come on. And so they w went with the, he went with the general back to his office, and there's where he told him, this system that we've, d we've got for you uh, is, is very, uh, very simple, it's just easy to use, uh, and uh, and he started bellowing about it. Well, we, that's fine, but I, I expected a wartime system, and, and I, I, I don't know what you were talking about in, the, in that briefing just now, but uh, I, I want to see it. He said, all right, well, it's so simple, that it, and any simple thing can run. It doesn't matter who you are. He says, now, what, you want, what I want you to do is Hit this key and this key and over here and all push it all down together at the same time. And when he did that, the screen, the, the screen of his computer blinked and it came up wartime system. What it did, it, it was a faster system than the system he was using because it dumped 30, was 66 percent of his database and, and re, re, refreshed it with um, keeping keeping the names and the units and where people were assigned. And, and such and, and pertinent information about the, the soldier, but it also included acronyms and things like that that you don't use in peace science in wartime, like WIA wounded in action, mm -hmm. KIA killed in action, MIA missing in action, and, and other kinds of things uh, that uh, did, did not appear in the peacetime system. But all the dependence data and, and, and things like that was gone. And it was, it, detailed information about his training, past assignments, all gone. Had a skeleton, and, and they could, they, they, it was like a form, you just read it, you're done, it's one page. So, um, I think the general was pleased, but he still threw Steve out of the office. <laughs> Steve was by himself. All right, now, I guess you were, as you were kind of setting this up, you were referencing being in, in war zone in, in the 90s. Now. Gulf War is 1991, and you had retired in 89. Yeah, this, so I found this out. So, so you learned this later. Okay, so there, there was sort of an epilogue to the story about Schwarzkopf not wanting the upgrade to his system when you tried to give it to him. And then when he got it, he was complaining he didn't have it. And sure right. enough, it was on his system all, it was laying in, in the background, mm -hmm. and all he had to do was hit it. All right. Now, Ed Berber, who tested the system, mm -hmm. when he went over there, he knew the system. Mm -hmm. I mean, he practiced it personally in his own office. And, and so he didn't have that question. Okay. And then what unit had he been commanding when you sent your guys to him? 
Was he on the West Coast at that point? Uh, what, Ed or, or Ed? Yeah, because you were you were basically because Schwarzkopf wouldn't take, didn't want to be the one. And he was in Georgia. Him. Yeah. So we so we went we we, 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 we took our, our case and pleaded with the commander of the Seventh U.S. Infantry Division, and, and he was in California. Mm -hmm. And so it was a subsequent assignment to that. He was a two-star. He moved up to three-star and so forth, mm -hmm. and eventually four. But in his later assignments, when he was out in, in, in the wartime environment, he knew the system because mm -hmm. he, he tested it. And he, and he went down there when his brigade commanders and battalion commanders were in the gymnasium, and they're broken down in their little cubicles, and they, were, they would communicate with each other. And, and it worked. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they used satellite communication. Right? They were sitting in one building, and that satellite was still communicating. The interesting thing about the box, two men could carry it. Mm -hmm. And it finally became a laptop. But the box itself, if you were in a combat situation or even a training situation, and you dropped it off the, the, the two, and a, two and a half or five ton truck, it, it, it could survive that. If a tank drove, drove over it, it wouldn't survive that. So it, let's say it was my computer and it, that the tank drove over it and, and maneuvered. It just happened. It fell off the truck and the tank was making a turn and, and it got wiped out. All I'd have to do is go down to the supply room, get myself another two-man lift computer, bring it in, plug it in, type in my username and my password, and one of two satellites would, would, would reload that thing to my last finger touch on the keyboard. Wow. And that was, that was universal. Mm -hmm. And today that doesn't seem, sound so surprising with everything in a, in a cloud somewhere, but we're talking late 1980s at this point. And 1980 technology, mm -hmm. and, but it was uh, 21st century philosophy. Mm -hmm. And all we did is we updated it uh, all along the way. And when they finally got their laptops, they were able to get all that stuff in there. Mm -hmm. And they had one baseline instead of three. Okay. Now, roughly when uh, did this happen? When did you have start using that system? They, uh, we started using it live uh, in peacetime. Yeah. Mode. I mean, basically, in what year was it that you were going to the 7th Division? And well, the 7th Division was, uh, I think it was about 85, 86, okay. maybe, maybe 87, in that time frame. Mm -hmm. and, and so I'd fly out to California, and we, we, we have our little soldier back and forth talk, and then uh, we'd scope out uh, with him and his folks who worked directly with us, because he couldn't spend a lot of time mm -hmm. with us, and uh, how we need to organize a, a command post exercise, an arm post in one, in one of the gym, gymnasiums. Later on, he, he could put it out in, in, his, in, his, in his training areas, and, and they're separate physically, but they're doing the same thing they did in the gymnasium, so they practice in the gym, took it out here, and it still worked. Mm -hmm. And he'd, 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 he'd walk around, just, just, just look around and see what's going on. So the peacetime system worked very well, and that's where we got our statistics of 99.6% accuracy, mm -hmm. no older than 48 hours. So uh, and the, the wartime system was super fast because it had had a lot of room it could expand mm -hmm. if you needed it for, for, for something. So that started to show up uh, in, in, uh, as I was leaving in 1989, but it didn't get into the battlefield until 1990. Mm -hmm. Now, they used it when they went into Panama. I was already out of service. They, they used it when they went into Panama, and, 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 but they also had the backup system working at the same time. Mm -hmm. So. It, they learned something from that which helped them further improve it before it went overseas to the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Units deploying normally. I'm not here. All right. Uh, so now, what other kind of initiatives or projects did you run while you were in that last assignment? Uh, the last assignment, uh, I, I, I was, uh, I, when I reported in, uh, there was a two star general commanding general of, of the. Army, Army Personnel Command, 
And uh, I just went up there and I just checked in like I would anybody else. I'm just arriving and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm your senior chaplain. And the guy said, oh, that's fine. He visited a little bit. Uh, he uh, was a four brag. First, or one of those, and and uh, 82nd uh, Airborne, and and so he he hurt him, he injured himself on one of his parachute jumps. So we were watching him, and eventually they, they retired him out of that because uh, he did hurt, he really did hurt himself. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, he was just at, at a place where he could be functional in a positive way because he was a very good motivator and knowledgeable about everything that was going on, including. Uh, he got involved in what we were doing, and that was part of bringing the personnel management system into the reality of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. Very supportive. So uh, we continued our, our seven Bible uh, studies, uh, and he was aware of that too, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the confines of those office buildings, the two, build, two buildings. And so that, that, that worked out uh, uh, very well. The second time around, uh, I, this was the second time I was in that command. Mm -hmm. And in my in my organization, the first time, where I was in officers management, we had a situation. Uh, one of my one, one of my folks uh, who lived in Maryland, husband, took his life, and so I got involved in that, and I traveled. From Alexandria, uh, Virginia, and to where she was, uh, and, and her mother, and, and spent some time w with her. She was just absolutely come undone, and it, she had a survivor assistance officer, but nobody would sit and just listen to her. Mm -hmm. So we, we took care of that, and uh, kept in kept in touch with her, and uh, she slowly got perspective. She was grieving. Well, I was faced with the same situation here. The, the, the gentleman that took his life uh, in, in a second tour uh, there, General Ralph and myself uh, and others, we, we went to the funeral and, and General Ralph drove. And I, I, I think it was in West Virginia, I'm not exactly 100% sure, but it was some, some distance, it took an hour and a half to, or two uh, to get there. And we went to the funeral and, and we listened to all the little stories that everybody had to say. Uh, and what happened was, he seemed to be disturbed, and, and when we got close to him, was one of my the, the one of my warrant officers who was really close to everybody, he helped me re by recruiting a lot of these guys that came in and with their skill sets, mm -hmm. and 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 we really tried to encourage him, and, and he seemed to bubble up, and he went home to spend, a, a, well, I don't know, maybe a, a week or a month or whatever it was his normal time off. Uh, on his no, no, uh, vacation, it's a time that's authorized, and uh, towards the end of it, uh, he took his life, and so we, we were we were absolutely shocked by that. So we went to the funeral, <clears throat> and uh, we had military honors at the graveside, and the general had me present the flag to mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the uh, I guess it was his mother. I don't know. I don't know what the deal was with the, with the wife. I, mm -hmm. I forget that part of it. But, Son was there, and and so we spent some time with him. But uh, gosh, what they told us was that he came there and he was fine. They went fishing with him. And I guess maybe they went even hunting together. And they just normal things that you do mm -hmm. when you're out in, in the wonderful, uh, beautiful countryside of West Virginia. And uh, once in a while, one of the guys would call him and say, yeah, he's doing great. But then. They, they went shopping one day and he put signs on, on, on the back bedroom door, do not enter, do not come in this room, and all that kind of stuff. I don't know what else he put on. And he took his life. And they came home to that. And so that was, that's, that, that was a hard trip to, that was a hard trip to build, to, to support them, and, and it took a long time for them to get perspective on that. Very, very difficult. So that gave me a little, little, uh, background before we visited that other fellow I think I told you about, mm -hmm. David Duckworth, and, and we did some invest investigating and there, there was nothing to substantiate that he took his life, mm -hmm. so that was not a suicide. These were definitely suicides. And um, 
and of course the police got the weapons and all that stuff and they checked their fingerprints and, and, they, and, and it took a while for them to, they had prima facie evidence to support their conclusion. The other one had nothing. Mm -hmm. So that, this was a heartbreak for us and that was a shock at the same time. So uh, we had uh, normal things that took place and we worked side by side with everybody to do mm -hmm. the work those things. All right. Now, is there a point here um, where you start to think uh, maybe it's time to retire, or is that a signal being given to you by anybody else? Because eventually you do go out in 89. So right. what leads into that? Well, so I've been there five years, and they, they figured I was, I, was, I was homesteading or something. We were, getting a, we, were, we were trying to birth a project that needed that extra, that needed the consistency of leadership mm -hmm. in order to get her done, plus the um, the rapport we had with commanders everywhere that would go into a, a, a division, a corps, um, and then later on the battalions and whatever else. And, and so they trusted what we're doing and in and, and, and such, and such a point where we, we would suggest that this is what this is kind of a thing you ought to do as a training exercise. And we'd, we'd, we'd either have somebody go over there and help them or we'd go over there now, but, but mostly our, our guys would go over and, and, and assist a, a unit, it doesn't matter what size it was, and, and that put, that's what made it ring, and we, got, we found out a lot of mistakes or, or things that we, we just didn't understand, we, could, we figured them out mm -hmm. in the field, and, and so uh, that, that really was a plus for the unit and, and us. Well, at some point, uh, they got a new general in and he's going to clean house. Mm -hmm. So, okay. They, when I got in that position in 1984, they upgraded from a lieutenant to a full colonel. Uh, I think I mentioned to you I had a couple of secretaries. The last one was came on as a volunteer, and finally I hired her, Sherry Marino. Right. And because she talked directly, I, I go to the Pentagon and I talk directly to the offices of the secretaries of, mm -hmm. in other words, Navy, Army, right. whatever, because we network with the, 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 the dependents, uh, the deer system, uh, where they, they, they get their, their, their uh, benefits because they're, they're a bona fide and validated uh, dependent. Mm -hmm. so, but, but all the services are connected with that same system. So we, we get with the Navy and we get with the Navy and the Marines and we get with the Air, 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 Force, Air Force and the rest of them. Uh, with the idea that our data that goes into their database needs to have the same structure. Now, one of the things that didn't work for the other departments was the fact they still had a six-digit uh, field for date. Mm -hmm. And, and, and we, we fixed that. And so, so what, what you have to do, you have to go through all your, all your software development and you have to move it and it, and it impacts stuff down here, so you have to move that stuff. To, anyway, it take, takes, it's a structural problem. Mm -hmm. And so we did that, and, and so they did it too. And, and their systems are different than ours. They might have that, that block somewhere else in the, in the total of their software, but as long as it's the same, it's compatible. Mm -hmm. So we <coughs> worked on two different so I, <coughs> I've worked with the, with the um, the captain or 06 and, and the, the department of the Navy Marine Corps and I worked with the 06 colonels and the other department. Well, my secretaries were calling all of them. One side to do this or do that, or maybe we're going to have some kind of a combined thing and, and, and somebody's pushing it, an outside agency, we need to get involved and, and they need to be with us. They need to be in it too. And so <clears throat> because of her direct contact, because that was in her job description, they promoted her to a secretary to be a, for a general officer. That was cool. So she, so then she left me. Mm -hmm. The Navy, the Navy recruited her mm -hmm. out of, right out of my office. And uh, I, I pretended like, uh, oh, everything's going to be fine. Oh, I don't like her being gone. Because she, I just hand stuff to him and walk away. Mm -hmm. and it was done. And, and, and the other guys that would travel too, not just myself, but they come in with this, this 
notes, and they, she had this shell. She just take take the shell, take certain, and then put in the changes, and and it was done. She could do it really well. Well, the person that replaced her, we just had a, a volunteer in there for a while. So six months went by. <clears throat> I got a phone call, and this real sheepish voice says, "Can I come back?" Mm -hmm. I said, "Well, it's vacant." So we got her back, mm -hmm. and then we, a couple of us went, went in my office and sat down with us. What happened? Somebody uh, in, in the Department of Navy had hired her in, in personnel management kinds of things. That mm -hmm. was fine. And they, they didn't give her a job description. <clears throat> they gave her a desk, and she, she was out here with several la ladies, one, two, three, whatever, four of them. And so one of the... Uh, Lieutenant Commanders, I guess, I came up to her and she said, I, I need a job description. I, I want to know what I'm supposed to be doing here. I'm earning this, all, this, all this nice money and, and uh, I want to contribute. And he says, you, you are contributing. Just come to work and look good. And okay. he walked away. So she put up with that for a while and she called us because she came back working for less money. Mm -hmm. But she was one of the men, one of the boys, and that kind of stuff. And so, and so was her husband. Mm -hmm. But they didn't care about her husband. They didn't care about Pete. They were interested in her. So uh, that was a hard lesson for her. When I left, when I, when I retired, uh, she went over and worked for either the Navy or the Air Force, their Inspector General office. And she was looking at the west side of the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. Um, the reason I got out was <clears throat> they, they wanted me to stay in. The, 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 the general office gone, and the replacement came in, and they wanted to clean shop. Mm -hmm. And so what, what what they were telling me is, well, we we we, we could uh, we could send you to Europe, and you could be the chief of uh, automation for the uh, United States Army Europe. Mm -hmm. And I thought about that. Uh, uh, moving the family and all that stuff for three years, and, and uh, what, you know, I come back here a foreigner almost, and then I'm trying to look for a second job. I don't think that would work very well. Well, we'll send you back to Fort Worth, and you can you can run their computer system. They didn't want to. They, they wanted me to stay in computer systems, mm -hmm. not 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 personnel right. or intelligence <clears throat> or anything with the infantry. So yeah, you could. This is a good wind down. Earn earn big money. Whenever I got promoted, I, I'd been in so long, I, I, I just went to the top level, top mm -hmm. paid scale thing. So that was you know, that was nice. And I was thinking about them, well, that's the wilderness too. That, that's kind of far from everything. So they, they were thinking of all these things that, that I, they could send me to. One of them was to become the deputy chief of staff for personnel, for General uh, Elton, who was in Panama. And that's the Southern Command, mm -hmm. whatever you call that. And they were under uh, lockdown because of the rebels and all that stuff. And there's a, there, there's a, there's a large uh, military facility there, and, and all the dependents had, were cloistered in that thing. You couldn't really go out to do what you normally could have done before because of the rebels, and, 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 and their lives were in danger. And I wasn't going to endanger them. I, 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 I got into I got into some intelligence reports, finding out just what the, what the depth of this stuff was. So finally, I, I don't know, the, the Lord said, why don't you just go to Roanoke? Roanoke, Virginia. Roanoke, two words, Roanoke. I don't know. Mm -hmm. we went, so we went to Roanoke in May, I mean March of 2000, uh, I mean uh, eight, 1989, looking around, mm -hmm. and we found a house that was out, out, in, out in, uh, in the city, but up in the mountains. And it, and it was, I wanted, I wanted trees and, and, and be ne next to water like a lake. Mm -hmm. Well, the best, of, the closest we got to was a swimming pool, 19,000 gallon swimming pool. Everything else was there, so, and it was inexpensive. It was the cheapest house in the block. So, it, but it was, we needed to fix it up. Okay, so we put a contract on that rascal and got it, and we're still in it today. Mm -hmm. But when we got that thing and moved our, we moved out like a, 
I've been down there and, and I retired out at the end of July, 1989. And then there we started a new chapter in our lives. One of the first things we did is work on the house. And when I ran out of money, I needed to find a job. And the disabled American veterans got a hold of me. And uh, not only did I become one of their volunteers, but they, they hired me to start running one of their thrift store operations mm -hmm. in, 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 uh, in, in the Roanoke Valley. And so after about a, a year, year and a half of that, they called me to uh, Ruthville where they had a Virginia, Department of Virginia, uh, a conference of some sort, and they interviewed me, and they hired me also at the same time to run seven thrift stores in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And they, they had rules, but some places just ignored them. And there was a lot of stuff disappearing. Mm -hmm. And it was, they were not making money. They, they, they went out of business two or three times and they'd hire the same people back because they didn't know anybody else. And I didn't know anybody except for those guys. So I, I told them, if you hire me, <clears throat> you also get my, my, my consultant. If you don't like my consultant, you don't need me. Mm -hmm. What consultant? I said, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Meeting adjourned. We'll, talk, we'll call you later. They called me and hired me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I had to put up with the Lord and myself. And, and, and that, that was a problem because some folks were really doing some bad things mm -hmm. as far as man, business management. Accounting was, was, need, was needed, upgrading hands were tied, I had to use their accountant and their banks. And uh, some mail came in to me in Roanoke. It was missent. should have been going to Richmond, some, somewhere to somebody in Richmond, but not me. Mm -hmm. And I opened it up, and what it was, it was a bank account in, in Richmond that some accountant had. It was $64,000 from the Disabled American Veterans Thrift Store operation, and he was using the money to lend out to high-risk uh, folks that needed loans. So I, I got that money, and then we, we leaned on him, and I got another $17,000 out of him. And then, and then uh, a, a local accounting service, uh, we, we got with them, and, and the guy that I talked to was one of the partners in it, and his name is David Rowan. He used to be the president of uh, the Society for Accountants in, in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So he coached me. He said, you know, you're going to have to do something. And so we, we looked around, and so we got involved with him. And he straightened all this mess out. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and once it got straightened out, the first clear year, we, we, we made over 1.3 million. We, we, we grossed. Mm -hmm. The next year was 1.5, and all of a sudden that disappeared. There was a clause in my contract that said, when I'm working, when anybody working for the division, uh, the uh, Department of Virginia for, for the DAV, uh, any residual at the end of the year, you, you, they got 10% off the top during the year. And if there's anything left over, they got that too. $365,000 was redistributed amongst 44 chapters. My, my backup money for growth was gone. Mm -hmm. And that happened uh, about, you know, after about five or six years I was with them. And, and, and so I struggled to get that squared away, did some other things. And finally, uh, after about 21 years, in, in in that, I I just I just bowed out of it. It was the leadership was coming in. They did they couldn't read reports. Uh, the, the, the Mr. David Long would come over and try to educate them. They were, they were uneducated. They weren't. They didn't have business or accounting or any, anything where you mm -hmm. get in in college. You get it in your as an uh, undergraduate. And so I, I just got out of that 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 mess. In the meantime, in 1990. Uh, Two, uh, I was elected as the department uh, chaplain for the state of Virginia, and I kept that until 
2013. Now, I was the only one that did that. But what we did, we brought a team on board. It wasn't a one-man show. Mm -hmm. And everybody got involved. And, and, and so that made it a community. And when we had problems within the community, in other words, the, the, the growing pains of society, and we had that amongst ourselves, we treat it. And we had the folks that were, it doesn't matter who it was, they, they, they get involved in it, so it was a community's resolution. And we, 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 we didn't uh, violate our, our mores or, 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 or our, our, our person at all. And so that was helpful. And the idea was to become faithful and work and, and for the good of our veterans through this organization that has, has tentacles and various uh, solutions out there, like the VA Medical Center or, or, or various programs, and the government has things that they do to help veterans and, 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 and the families. So we got involved in that. So that gave me a strong background with working families, and I got involved with quite a few uh, of those through the thrift store operation. But it was a, it, it was a, it was a very high-end challenge. Uh, I was paid for that, and uh, uh, for for the uh, thrift store. Mm -hmm. But as far as whatever I did in the, uh, the chaplain, uh, and that that was that was gratis to them, mm -hmm. and and but it was educational for me too. I even got the the, the opportunity to speak in various churches around in, in the Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, color or not. And that, that was that was that was that was excellent. Um, one one family of color adopted one of my sons, and then they would go shopping together and, and carry on, and, and just like like a parent with a child, and, and, and it's acting up in a shopping mall, and, and, and they, it, it, their dialogue was was just hilarious. But you know, Mama wants that. No, you can't have that. <laughs> that kind of thing. But that was good. That was positive because we needed that. A lot of folks are. They stay away from problems like that. Why don't you just treat them? Just come on, just come on a full bore, and and and, and, and but, but with, a, with a bit of grace, and, and, and make those things change. And so that helped. We didn't have that as, as a normal fair, but by golly, after after about three or four years, we started it, it, it started blooming, and it stayed with us for as long as I was in there. And I brought in a lot of folks. They, I mean, they, they came on board, and we had a, we had a tremendous choir, and, and those people were also giving as far as helping people that would come in to, to some of our meeting uh, uh, conventions throughout the year. We had three of them, three of them a year, and uh, so that that was for edu educational and, uh, and and very rewarding doing that. I had open heart surgery on a. October 2012, and I learned about it in 1984. A flight surgeon in the Pentagon uh, said, you, you have a heart flutter. They call it atrial fibrillation, mm -hmm. and your electrical system is messed up. It's going the wrong way. Mm -hmm. And so the left side is malfunctioning, and it's going to impact your heart somehow. And what it was, uh, research indicated that the aging orange, which was flowing in my blood, was was, was causing that elect electrical tr false transmission, and, and it, it, it got strong that way. So I, 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 they put me on some medicine to help, but it really didn't. And so it, 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 I, I went to I had pseudo heart attacks a couple of times in 1990 alone, and they even sent me down to Duke to the uh, VA there because it's a higher level. Capability, and and they said it's your electrical problem, and um, so they cardioverted me, and um, it went to a sinus normal sinus rhythm. Boy, I had a surge of power. Mm -hmm. It's amazing because I had a good flow, uh, uh, oxygenated blood flow. Mm -hmm. That was great, but it only lasted about a couple of weeks, and then it was shut down. And the medicine they gave me, I became allergic to it, and, and it, it, in one case. My eyes and, and my lungs started silting, so I got off that stuff quickly, and, and I didn't get on anything else. So by and by, I got I retired, and, and of course in, in 1990, I, during that early retired years, that, that's when I had some of this 1990 mm -hmm. stuff problems. And then later on, uh, I, I kept up with the civilian and 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 uh, VA sales, 
VA Salem really tried to help, but they didn't have the talent that the uh, local hospitals had. Mm -hmm. So uh, finally, my mitral valve failed. I, I, it wouldn't close properly, so I, I, I had half. If you had supposed to have X coming in, I had half an X mm -hmm. when this thing failed. So I was tired all the time, and, and my chest hurt me sometimes when there was nothing wrong with it except it, it was it didn't have enough blood in my head. And it was hard to do anything seriously cognitively because it didn't have the oxygenated blood that you should have, mm -hmm. and these are things that they, they were training me. So we got into the decision, do we have open heart surgery, and we did. And they took it out, and they took, they took the, it has three little feathers, they were extended, and they just, cut, they were twisted, and so it was coming this way. So the doctor, this little guy, he had to get on a soapbox to stand over me when I was in the operating room. He'd been there for years, mm -hmm. and, and uh, so he, he said he took it out, cleaned the place where he took it out, and then he took, the, he got rid of it, he, he trimmed it, he sculptured these, the end of it, and, and then put a composite ring in there and, and put it back, and then, and then he put full pressure on it. And when that thing was like this, nothing got through. Uh, it got through when, when it was open, but it didn't. When it locked up like that, it, the left uh, uh, ventricle didn't flush back. Mm -hmm. I had a surge of energy on that one, mm -hmm. and that worked. That worked very well. So that was, and so I've been uh, increasing my, I guess you call it, exercise, mm -hmm. walking, and, yeah. and 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 toning as far as that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So that that that's been good. Now in this time when we first moved in into Roanoke, our, our children were. One of them was finishing up high school, and the others were coming along behind mm -hmm. him. So as soon as uh, Andrew turned, the eldest turned 17, I took him down to Reserve Boulevard to the National Guard, and we signed him up. He, he got in the National Guard when he was 17, and then, and then he went to Virginia Tech mm -hmm. and got in the ROTC program, and he was also had his, had his uh, National Guard training mm -hmm. uh, at the same time. And then he got into Heidi Tidies, which is a, a, a really superb uh, military marching band. They, they're on the caliber of uh, what, what West Point has or mm -hmm. BMI. And so they, they, they even marched in one of the inaugurations. I think Mrs. Roosevelt put the lanyard around uh, inside out on, on, the, on the uniform. And they, today they wear it inside out on a, on a uniform. The lanyard mm -hmm. from her, so that's kind of a little tradition kind of thing. So he, he he did very well, and 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 such. And then Sean came along, and um, he had allergy, so he couldn't get in at 17. So he went into the uh, Virginia Tech, and we, we we checked him out with the various doctors because I was got I was didn't get my direct commission because I had this chronic whatever it was, sinus, mm -hmm. and really it was uh, seasonal hay fever. Mm -hmm. and, and once they determined he had the same thing, then, then he got into service. And David was uh, tore his number three son, tore his leg up in a lacrosse game and he put metal in it, and, that, and the military will not take you mm -hmm. because you'll be, a, you'll be a problem. And then with Daniel, as soon as he was itching to go down there, mm -hmm. and so he went down there and also got in the National Guard at the age of 17. So we started the boys that way. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then some time later on, not very many years later, um, my oldest grandson from the first marriage mm -hmm. uh, joined the Navy. Uh, I went to Annapolis and, 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 and now is serving in, in special operations. Married a woman uh, who's also a graduate of the Academy and she's a facility engineer at uh, Portsmouth uh, Naval Hospital. And so between them, they, they, they gave us great grandbaby number six and seven. And each one is named after a, a Navy SEAL that has died recently. And that's what, that's what they do. And so, and there's, a, there's a ring of them, several, not all the ladies mm -hmm. do this in that particular uh, unit. But 
many of them do. So they're, they're keeping their uh, beloved comrades that they've known a lot. Okay. Now, uh, on another side of things, I think whether before we do the interviews or somewhere in there, you mentioned something about having uh, multiple different academic degrees. I think you talked about you got a bachelor's degree, you had an MBA. Did you go on to others at different points? When I was at the Command and General Staff College, uh, I was te teaching management, and uh, so some of the some of the leadership uh, within the faculty said, "Why don't, why don't you work? With, you've got you've got all the back, you've got all the basic stuff done, and and, and, and you came out with you know, the top end of your, your, your class." So all you have to do is write a, write a, write a thesis that will cover uh, something, either the, the science part or the arts part. So I talked to him a little bit about this surveillance and depth thing. Mm -hmm. And the arts part is knowing military maneuvers and, and postures and, and the implications of those things and the strengths and weaknesses and so forth. And, but the, the arts part, the, the, the science part, was knowing, knowing how to use, and I use math as, 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 a, as, a, as a tool to structure the, 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 the kind of the basic concept that implemented the surveillance in depth process. So you take knowledge of how to deploy the military forces within the context of what the math is telling you. Mm -hmm. Cause it, it, it would, you set, set, set the terrain up into, into little cells based on the, uh, the uh, geographic structure. And then you'd, you'd, you'd give it a unique alphanumeric number, and then you'd run a, you, you could run a, and I had a, mat, I had a, a numbers book full of random numbers, and you, you could randomly every day change that, mm -hmm. the alphanumeric number and you just send that out in classified mode and, and in there you, you'd also drop in and, and, and you had a, a list over here and, and you could run a, 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 run a random alphanumeric number against that to figure out where to put these different things and, and if you had something that was du duplicating here you, you'd get rid of one mm -hmm. and move it over here. So you have it. You have some. You can make a decision. And when it was published, they had the, the breakdown, of the people, and then whoever was going out into anywhere uh, uh, into this area that you've, you've restructured into African American portions of real mm -hmm. estate, then they, they would be told, well, uh, today in this in this area uh, we're going to have people, and this area, this area, this, we're just going to have surveillance, and at sundown we're going to have machine gun run here, you know, to have an aircraft helicopter drive by and just shoot the place up and leave. Because it was an all fire zone. If we had no fire zones, we'd make sure that those were always blocked out. We just put visual on them. You know, we would tell the enemy they didn't know the difference. And uh, or or if we we're gonna put somebody out <clears throat> and then and then we do something else and pick them up over here. So, and so we have no fire here, no fire here, and while they're moving this stretch of real estate they're coming through, we, we, we just have visual but no, no contact. So we, we try to figure in all that. So I, I wrote a paper on it and it was, it was voluminous, it was terrible, it was just unbelievable. But I was able to get it down to, with, with charts, graphs, and a sampling of the mathematical structure mm -hmm. for the, all of this in 125 pages. So I got a <laughs> I got a master's degree of military arts mm -hmm. and another master's degree of military uh, science. So I left that and, and then when I, when I got out of the service in, in 2002, uh, I was attending First Baptist Church in Roanoke, Virginia, and we got, uh, our, our, our pastor had, uh, had uh, retired after 40 years, I don't know, a long time. And uh, so we got a new pastor in, and he was an evangelist, he wanted to do things. So he appointed me as his mission 
minister, and I didn't have any formal training in that. I just I just read the Bible and had Bible studies and mm -hmm. all that stuff everywhere. And I belonged to the Gideons International, so I was out doing things and learning how to do those things too. You know, speaking in churches about what God's doing around the world and, and the impact of uh, <clears throat> having access to over into 215 countries speaking 93 different languages fluently. Because they're all natives. We just recruit natives and turn them on. All right, so he wanted me to do that. So what I did is I got into that, and after the, I got in 2002, so 2003 or four, I, I connected with a large church in Atlanta, Georgia, Woodstock, Baptist Church in Georgia, and I, I, I hung out with them for two years, and they were training me and, and several other guys around uh, uh, America how to become mission pastors. Because nobody, no, there's no training for that. You go, you go to the seminary, and, and they, they're talking all this other stuff, but they don't touch on it. They, they just said they, they structure that, and, and then walk away. They don't say how to do it. And so they're teaching me how to do it. And so one one of the things that you do is you motivate people in the pews uh, to, to get involved, okay? And so you tell them, no, you motivate them. You have, to get, you have to sort of get alongside of them, stand up with them. So one of the first things we taught them was, and I, and I went to the International Mission Board in Richmond, and, and, and so I, I, they gave me outlines of training that they train missionaries. So I brought that back and I started implementing that. So they, they come out, and, and I, one of the things we teach everybody is how to how to be an intercessor prayer a prayer person, uh, walking, so prayer walking they call it. And uh, but you could do it in your car when you're driving with your eyes open, of course. And uh, there's all kinds of things you can do with it. And you're not walking up to people and saying, "Hey, Bob, uh, my name is Roger." I, 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 do you know the Lord? If you don't, you're going to go to hell. No, no, you don't do that. Uh, what you do is you see people and, and you talk to God about people instead of talking to people about God. So some folks really got interested in that, so they, they tried it. Maybe about 15 of them. And they went out trying this stuff, and then we took it to Berlin, and we took it to um, different parts of Asia. Uh, we took it to in China. Taiwan, we took it to uh, Canada, we did some other things too, and in Canada we, we built a, a missionary center in, in, in Prince Edward Island and also uh, in, in uh, Alberta, and, uh, and then we came back to Alberta and built housing for students. But we still went out in the community, prayer walking. And the results, some things started happening. So they came back and told their buddies, I did this, and all of a sudden that happened. Mm -hmm. Really? And, and so, they, so all of a sudden, 15 became 30. And then uh, the other thing is that they talked to uh, international level missionaries, you gotta have a, a servant's heart. So if you were the missionary, say, it doesn't matter where you were, you could be somewhere in Kenya or somewhere in the world, and, and, and uh, so we, we, we'd go there, we could be in South America with you, and you had a schedule, and we had a schedule laid out, but sometimes either weather or opportunity would change, and so we get up one day, and we were supposed to go to the hospital, and instead we went to the schools, and, and you change that, uh, because of the, the opportunity popped up, you don't get that every day, so we, we go to the schools, and the, the attitude of the men and the women who went, was we can do that, and so that got out, and they liked that. The other thing that happened was in doing that, we didn't have always an ordained minister in charge of the team, but we had somebody that was interested in the country, maybe had the language, or something, or maybe they had a, been interested because their 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 the background ancestry came from where wherever, and so uh, they would be in charge. And, but they'd have to come back and let us know what was happening. And that became inflammatory after a while. So then the other thing that we did, <clears throat> uh, when we had people visit our church, we would visit them. 
And some people would, would, would visit, you know, for a week and maybe go back a, a second week and drop it. What we did, we, we put them in by zip code and we built, we eventually built 20 teams of two or th three people. And every Wednesday, we'd send out at least 10, 10 teams. And it wasn't same, the same 10 teams, but some, some folks would uh, go maybe twice a month, once a month, whatever. And, and, and so that worked out very well, and they, and they liked the results. Same thing, prayer walking. And then we had, we had a, we had a three-step three way of approaching. You open the door and let them do all the talking. And you look for the, you look for the hook. And wherever the hook was lying, and we tried, we tried to share with each other back and forth, and that's what helped build us even into a stronger group of people who were out on the street. But you, you look for hooks, and, then, and we'd, learn, we'd, we'd share them with each other. Somebody would say something about having trouble with a child, or, or maybe they're having difficulty at work, or maybe they're having a health problem, or an anger problem, or, or uh, you know, life is boring problem. And so those are hooks where you can open it up and, and, and show them some, a little bit of scripture and a personal testimony. And, and they see, oh, that, that's all, that's different. And, and would you like to know this Jesus? 80% of the time they said yes. It doesn't matter what language is in either. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that, that, that was working along that, and worked that along for uh, up to about 2005. And while I was doing that, I, f I finished two years with, with the Woodstock, and I still have connectivity with the mission pastor. Mm -hmm. Still have. I, I mean, I've, I've seen him ten years later, and I haven't seen him. He, he knows who I am, because I'll, I'll go to the International Mission uh, Training Center uh, and, and for something. Maybe we're going to support something, because we go there and, and we, we encourage m candidates that will become missionaries, mm -hmm. and, and we love on them during part of their orientation uh, when they're first arriving. So we get them set up in their, their five vi villages in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. and, and so we get them settled in there. And, and so I, I bump into these, uh, this, this gentleman once in a while. So that, that, that worked well. Then I went to Indianapolis, uh, Evans, Indianapolis, uh, the Trinity Seminary for two years. And then I came back uh, with all that background and writing and, and research and what I'm reporting and infiltrating that into what we're doing in, the, in this mission outreach to the world and, and got involved with a uh, um, New Life new, new Life Bible Seminary, whatever it was. It's, it's, it's a buddy of mine. He happens to be a maintenance man at the Salem VA Medical Center, and he was the chancellor of and creator of this seminary black guy, so I was the only white guy going through the school. <laughs> and they liked that because I, I taught them prayer walking, and he knew that. Mm -hmm. He wanted me to do that. So he, I, I, later on, I'd, I'd continue to do that. But I, I got a, 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 a PhD in theology out of that, all that experience, mm -hmm. plus writing a, a thesis for him. And what I did is I, I basically summarize what I just told you about being in these other places mm -hmm. and where I, what I picked up from the International Mission Board and I did some stuff for uh, the North American Mission Board also. One of the things that Charlotte and I did by ourselves, we went up to Prince Edward Island and we, we planned this. We've been up there before and I said, I'm going to bring my wife sometime but I need some help. And a fellow by the name of, I think his last name was Welsh. Uh, he was born in Entry Island, uh, and, and that island is in the uh, St. Lawrence Gulf. It's, a, it's part of a chain of s six islands, uh, and they call the six islands Ile de Madeleine, the, island, the Madeleine Island. It, 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 it depends on the size of your, your, your map, you won't even find the, the islands, mm -hmm. but if, it's gets, if it gets large enough, or whatever it is, you can see them. So anyway, uh, what we did, we spent 72 hours. We, 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 we flew to Prince Edward Island, got on a boat for five hours, and spent 72 hours on it. Five islands are connected with, the bridge, with bridges, mm -hmm. and the Entry Island was here. Entry Island is British, and these were French. Mm -hmm. Now it's all Canadian. But it's still English speaking here and French here. So we landed over here when we speak French. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, my friend, 
very well. She speaks English, but he has he, he also speaks some, some some French. When we were aboard the ship, we're going there with the intent of finding out how do you win those fourteen thousand people to the Lord? What what is going on on the island? And and then try to if there's anything of value we can capture, we share it. Okay. So <clears throat> on the five hour trip, we. Brother Welch bumped into some guy he knew, and, and the guy hated Americans, and he thinks everybody that's in Vietnam, not Vietnam, well, yeah, Vietnam and, and later on places, um, uh, should, you know, good for them if they get killed. You know, it doesn't matter what, where they are in the world, whether it's Vietnam or Panama or some other place. And he was just really mean. So at, 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 towards the end of the trip, we, we finally revealed who we were, and, uh, and he just, he was just kind of quiet. He didn't get pushy or change his mm -hmm. de decorum. Anyway, we didn't tell him a whole lot. You get on that island and you sneeze, and six people will sneeze mm -hmm. or say Gesundheit. Mm -hmm. So we, by the time we got there and we got settled in our little hotel, next morning we, we came out and, and we were trying to figure out where do we go next. And a loud truck went roaring by on the highway, just right next to the hotel, and squalled its brakes back down, came down the drive, slammed on the brakes, jumped down. Here's this guy that hates America. He says, you need to see my boss. I'm in shipbuilding. Well, Welch knew that. I didn't know that. I'm in shipbuilding. I pulled these seagoing fishing boats. And he's really, he's, he, he, he goes to this umpty young Baptist church over here, and I'll bet you he can give you some leads. Now, where did that happen? So he said, okay. So we went there. So we went up the island, and he was way out there. This little, little thing that stuck out like that, and the building was real long, and, and the, the boat started with a hole here, and when it came out the other end, it went out in the water. Mm -hmm. And big, you know, I don't know how big they were. But that was how we got started uh, on the island. And so what Brother Welsh knew everybody. He really did. He, did, I mean, he grew, grew up in Entry Island, went to school over here, and he, he, he was with these people in business. And so we met all the leadership in, in any position. We met captains, sea captains now, this, this, this kind of trip. Mm -hmm. They also come down the St. Lawrence River to, to El de, El de Madeline. Mm -hmm. And so we met some of those in, in their homes, and I took pictures of everybody. And then <clears throat> there's a Catholic church there. There was a Jehovah Witness church there, and then this Baptist guy. And the Baptist guy, he, he, he was very open to us, and we interviewed him too, and, and, and we got information, we talked to, we talked to everybody. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then we visited some of his relatives. They're in, they're, they're in the fishing business. And one of them, uh, when we arrived in the morning about seven, he was just unloading his, his, his rig. He'd been out there since about two or three o'clock this morning. He got a load of lobster, so he unloaded. We went to his house, a nice, modest home. It was well built. Could fight the weather because mm -hmm. everything froze would, fro would freeze up during the winter months, and you, the only way you can get in it was by air. The guy that was beating up on us was the pilot, and so he would fly in, and he. And he we, we, we engaged him and found out what his, he'd bring in supplies and, mm -hmm. or haul out people that needed to get, to get a doctor's appointment in Prince Edward Island or where. But anyway, so we met with him and my wife said, oh, I saw those lobsters. Oh, they're so wonderful. And he said, do you like lobsters? Oh yeah, come back at 4.30. So he left. We, we left. Mm -hmm. and so, so Brother Welch called back the house. What happens? I went back, I bought, bought, bought back some of my fish. So that's what I'm going to cook. I'm, I'm putting them in the boil now. Mm -hmm. People are trying to get to be ready when you get here at 4 30. <laughs> and that helped to us over and over and over and over again. Everybody was glad to see us. Mm -hmm. We met some people with some long, great stories, and, and they had good contacts. The last person we saw, who was probably the most influential island and a person in the island, was the editor of the La Radera which is a newspaper. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's, he's kind of a risque kind of fellow. So we walked in on that, and he has one of his girlfriends there. And uh, so we just greeted her, like, you know, and she bought us some, I 
guess coffee or tea, mm -hmm. I, forget, I don't know what it was. But he was really excited to find out what we were doing. We'd come to evangelize the island. He said, oh yeah, this is a great place to come. And I've been here since, and we knew we, we knew this because we were briefed. Mm -hmm. And we took pictures of him. We didn't take pictures of his girlfriend. And he said, now here's what you do. You want to evangelize the whole island. What you need to do is Sam Lackland, when he died, he was a millionaire, had a business in Canada, but he, this is the place that he relaxed and went fishing and relaxed with his family. He left several millions of dollars and he's downtown in our Department of Community Services. And Sue Greenbridge is the director. She's the executive director of that operation. I will call her and make an appointment for you. What you do is you volunteer. You volunteer for her. And and and, uh, and you help people, and, and as you're helping people, share your story, mm -hmm. and it, it, you you go from helping to introducing. But if you just go and knock on the door and say you're going to go to hell unless you know the mm -hmm. Lord, that's not that's not going to work here. And he's right. You can't, it doesn't work in Poland. It doesn't work in Czechoslovakia. It doesn't work in South America. It, that, that just does not work. But if, if the India especially. Uh, if you, if you show, show them some truth and, and, and touch their lives, then, then they'll be interested and uh, they'll, they'll explore that. Mm -hmm. So we weren't trying to start a church. We don't need your money, none of that stuff. So, all right, so we got finished. He was really a, he was a hoop, he was a big help. So anyway, we, we wrapped that up, came home, I wrote a 22-page paper with, with, with photographs and I sent it to the North American Mission Board because they're in America, not, not just in the world. So that's how we took care of that. Okay. And you killed another hour. Okay. Now at this point, we've now taken a look at some of your uh, post-military career and discussed your mission work, and you kind of closed out the story of going out uh, to the Ile de la Madeleine and Prince Edward Island, I guess province, but separate islands, uh, and that work there. Uh, and I guess, how do you, I guess, now how do you see things coming together, or what are you doing now, or whatever, that builds on all of that military and post-military experience? Uh, well, while I was in the, in the mission uh, field for the church, even when uh, they, they moved somebody else uh, to uh, absorb it into his organization so he would be happy, whatever that is, takes work to keep up with this stuff. Mm -hmm. But we got into Berlin Berlin several times. I speak to language, and that helped. And, and uh, some really interesting uh, miracles happened in our face during our prayer walking. I mean, it's amazing. People walked up to us out of, the, out of the blue, and they said, there's something different about you, and we want to know what it is. And, and they, they were foreigners. Mm -hmm. they, they weren't Americans. And it's kind of interesting to see that that, that happen. And, and, uh, so that, that carries over into what we're doing now, in a sense that <clears throat> these people that we're, we're now touching in, in this ministry we call, it's not ministry, it's a, it's a, it's a secular organization, but <laughs> it turns into a ministry. Mm -hmm. And it's called Military Family Support Centers Incorporated. Mm -hmm. The reason why I'm calling it centers, it's with the anticipation that it will grow in other states. Now we have connectivity, certainly throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia, but we're serving people in Maryland, West Virginia, Kentucky, North Carolina, California, Texas, Arkansas, Pennsylvania. And because they get a hold of our website, that's how we get it, the, the, the people outside the states. But we also have people in the surrounding states of Virginia who are members of our either our reserve units, our, our Navy Reserve, Marine Reserve, Coast Guard Reserve, Army Reserve, Navy Reserve, and that kind of thing, or our Air or Army National Guard in the Commonwealth of Virginia. They, they live in other states, but they're part of us here in the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. So what we did in set, settling up the, this uh, military family support center, I was over at church in my office doing whatever I was doing, and I got a call uh, from the secretary, the, the, the pastor's secretary, 
uh, and this happened about 2004, I think it was in maybe summertime, I don't know, can't remember. And, uh, and uh, uh, what it was, uh, somebody from the uh, local armory called and they were looking for a pastor to help them because they were creating a new organization and they wanted to have some kind of a spiritual guide to round out their team, whatever that is, whatever it is. And it's something to do with families. And that, that, that was all I got. We didn't have a name. So, uh, <clears throat> without telling anybody anything, and Command Sergeant Major Tony Price was the guy that was making the call. His, his, his immediate super supervisor, superior officer, was a lieutenant colonel by the name of uh, Lapsa uh, Flora, a uh, Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's interesting about his boss is his boss was in, um, grew up, born and raised in Vietnam, and when the war came to an end, he had to flee to the jungle with his family. He was a, he was a child, and, and they ate bugs, and they ate anything. They, they just ate off whatever they could find in, in, the, in the land to eat. And, and so when he got old enough, uh, or, or threatened enough, that he was uh, now 18 years old, uh, they, they would put him in the transition schools they were putting people in, trying to get them converted to communism or central government or whatever it is that they were doing. And so he, he left, he got on a boat, and he, and he came to America. He's a boat person. So here he got, he was adopted by a couple in Boone's Mill, I think, which is in the, it's a small town just south of, uh, of, of uh, Rono. And the Flora family adopted him and gave him their name. And so they, they grew him up in their local high school, I mean, the local uh, public school, mm -hmm. and he qualified. His father had been an officer, or, or I think so. He is a graduate of uh, Virginia Military Institute in Lexington. And uh, so whatever he did, whatever he had to do, he, he got him involved in that. And he was a su su superb, superior student. He just, he was, he just a, outstanding uh, student. His English was impeccable. He, he got that way with it. And, uh, and, and so he was uh, commissioned also in the, in the Army. Uh, and I think he, at that point he was in the National Guard, but nonetheless in the Army. And through the, through the years he, he served exceptionally well and, and one was, was uh, chosen to uh, command the local battalion that was in Roanoke uh, Armory. So he, he was doing that, and so he let his command sergeant major recruit this team, but he was a major supporter. So his unit is the, the founding unit, mm -hmm. and his upline uh, was in desperate need of help for military families. There's nothing out there for him, <clears throat> because all of them mostly are away from military post camps, stations, and forts. And so if something goes awry, when I was on active duty for so many years, I just go down to the local whatever it was, and, and they, they either had it there, or they had the technician there, or I could somebody would show me how to repair my car, or, or if, if I, whatever I could get, I could buy food, or there was a, there was a food food pantry, or, or if I needed something for the house, I, I could get a, a desk or a bed or whatever, and all of that. There was something in, on post camper station. There's nothing for these people. Sixty-seven percent of military families live in rural areas. So anyway, um, so they were enthused about this unit taking on this exploring. Mm -hmm. So I, I showed up and I didn't tell them who I was and they just knew I was from the local church. Hey you. <clears throat> and um, so the command sergeant major briefed him, they introduced us to the commanding officer who waved at us and walk, walked away because he wanted that sergeant major to get his work. Mm -hmm. Getting to go to work. There must have been 35 people there, businessmen from all walks of life. Some of them, I think two or three of them, had former military experience, but everybody else was just a civilian in, in some some business uh, adventure. And the idea was, uh, and some of the testimony we got, there was a woman who lived not far from where Virginia Tech is, five children, her husband was deployed, and she was pulling her hair out. 
I mean, she was losing it. She was loud, aggressive, and, and vocal. And so to fix that, uh, what Command Sergeant Major did, he went to a local church, and uh, four or five of the ladies rotated, <clears throat> and being in, in the household helper with an everyday load, and just be a good listener, a good conversationalist. And sometimes they'd run into stuff, and they, and then, and then somebody else would go get whatever they needed, and, and so that kind of helped. And that would be a, that was a good example for others because they, they were <clears throat> sure that there were others in the woods someplace not not made, made known. So that was passed to us, and <clears throat> we talked about <clears throat> whatever our experiences were with neighbors that might have problems but they're not military, and then others talked about their military experience. And then he asked me if I had any military experience, and that's when I got the, the bird floated out. Mm -hmm. And so I told him my experience uh, as an enlisted man, and also as an officer, uh, and, and not only uh, getting the help in America, but when I was in any foreign country, same thing. And uh, so that means when I was in combat, my wife was in a, in a military facility family or a military mm -hmm. facility, and uh, only one time uh, she was off, she was away from, physically out of the facility, but it was still, she could go back on post at camper station and get something. Mm -hmm. So she still had an umbrella, but, but, but uh, these people, Anthony was talking about, they don't have, they don't have anything. Mm -hmm. So, all right, so I went to the men's room, came back, and I found out I was elected president. <laughs> I'm still president and bottle washer, and I sweep the parking lots and everything else. So, uh, so we started with, with that notion that we would do something. So we had to figure out first a name that would pretty much reveal who we are, mm -hmm. and, and and then at the same time we had to present it up to not only to the lieutenant colonel who was all f for anything that was positive like that, but to get together with various groups that, that were pro military. One group is a, the 29th Division is a National Guard unit that's spread out. Part of it is in Maryland and the rest of it's in Virginia. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we had to go to the, we went to the leadership of that organization plus in Virginia and Maryland you have an adjutant general that's separate and distinctive and that, that structure, so we had that to contend with. But a social organization they had called the 29th, a so, 29th Division Association. It didn't say 29th Infantry Division, mm -hmm. 29th Infantry Division writer, none of that, mm -hmm. just 29th Division Association. So we went to the 29th Division Association and they gave us, the, the Post 64 in Roanoke, and they're still around, gave us seed money, our first seed money several thousand dollars from them to start something that nobody had out there. We looked on, on the internet and there were no such nothing. 98% mm -hmm. of the organizations out there had all kinds of things going on and maybe 2% had some reference to families. But not, no, nobody was dedicated to families. So we, we, we thought that was interesting but also sad. I put this thing together with the idea that, uh, okay, uh, we need money. Uh, we had to write job descriptions and for who's going to, we, who, what are we going to do and how are we going to do it, who are we going to do it with, and, and such like that. And, and so one of the first things that happened, uh, we couldn't stay at the armory because they, they, that was under contract to be destroyed, eliminated. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, plus, uh, uh, it might be some folks don't want to come to a barbery mm -hmm. to pick up groceries or pick up, uh, maybe have a counseling session mm -hmm. or whatever they were looking for. So we wanted to be, get in the community, but still, we were limited. So we, we, we went, got into Salem and, and we lo uh, originally located our organization in the uh, Post 3 American Legion which is out in the community, a lot of room around, and it's, it's really pleasant. So if you had somebody come that needed a counseling, they could do it inside, or mm -hmm. sit under a tree, more casual, mm -hmm. that, that kind of stuff. 
And in the basement we had a food pantry, a very modest food pantry that had clothing in it, bits and pieces of um, furniture and maybe a few appliances. Uh, and uh, I mean, it's very small space, very small, uh, less than a thousand square foot, mm -hmm. very small space. And, and so we started with that. And then we had a lot of activities. And the activities, uh, we'd have the, 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 to give the mothers a, a day, you know, a, a break, uh, we would take the teenagers down to Adventureland and wear them out. Mm -hmm. And then there was things to do down there, they'd blow a whole day down there. And we'd feed them and all that. And the babies, we had people who were qualified, we background check, everybody got background check. And uh, so we take care of the babies. And uh, so the ladies, we, one time some local Dodge dealer gave us five vans, and we had drivers that were cleared, and they took them to some one place, and they had uh, sort of a breakfast thing, and and Belks or somebody had a fashion show for them, and then they went from there to some uh, to uh, I forget it was where it was it was a shopping center, but they had a, a couple of places where we could partial them out to where some of them could start off and get the pedicure while the others were over doing something else and then we'd switch. So we did that for a while and then we brought them in uh, for lunch and dressed them up and they, 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 they went to some, one of the other ladies shops and got some things they liked and they, they, they modeled those and we also gave them a, each one a hundred dollar gift certificate to one of some other place that was a, the next place we went to and uh, so the, the, we had a day like that. And they had a lot of time of laughing and, and, and just carrying on and enjoying each other's company, which they never got together as a unit. And, and, and we were sort of just there. But we didn't, we were just there. Mm -hmm. So we were the driver or the, or the introduce the next mm -hmm. point of contact where, where we're going, where we're headed. That, it, was, it was a day of surprises for them. So at the end of the day, they were wiped out. So we brought them back to the to the um, American Legion building and had had maybe a last cup of tea and got them quieted down and, and reacquainted them with their children and uh, and then said goodbye. And we got some good feedback from that. Excellent feedback, very positive. But but some of them would come back to us because they, they they started to mention some things to their lady friends mm -hmm. in the unit. And, and, and then they decided to follow up with us. So we don't have counseling, but we have referrals. So we, mm -hmm. we, we get a baseline for them and refer them to somebody that, who we have vetted. Mm -hmm. uh, we saved three, we, we say, we would have had to have insurance for at least $3 million if we counseled. Yeah. We, we just didn't do that. And our guys uh, didn't want to take a chance. They didn't want to do that, so they, well, okay. So, so, so that worked out fine. So we had referrals. We helped them with the children. Sometimes they needed extra uh, assistance, uh, and, and so we'd maybe coach the school staff about this particular child. But we would go in there and sort of advocate for the for the for the mother, and that that was very very helpful. Um, then the next problem was, what do you do? They're getting ready to have dad come home. We had some ladies, so mom to come home, but mostly guys. And so the, uh, the National Guard had some programs to help us with that. And so we brought them in at the right time, get ready for Rudy, he's gonna be different, you're different, and you're gonna have to work your differences out. And here's, here's what's available to you when those differences rise. And that was important, that really paid dividends. One of the things that was extremely important was that when the, when the soldiers, sailors, marines, whatever, came back, we needed to acquaint, acquaint them immediately, and they were told to do this, with the uh, Veterans Administration, they changed it to Veterans Affairs Medical Center. They had their last, last dental checkup and a physical and questions, and that, that was important to get that done, and, and they got signed in. Some of them didn't do that, and, and it, caught, it created a lot of problems later on. Some of these guys became suicidal, and, 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 and we, we didn't see anybody do anything 
but we know that there was a lot of guys, there was a number of guys that had hurt, terminated their lives when they came back. And so we eventually got them in the VA and the VA was able to do something or refer them to some civilian, somebody that they trusted mm -hmm. or whatever. So we, 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 we continued that and then uh, there, was, there was some financial problems going on at the American Legion and they needed space or they wanted more whatever. We didn't have any more uh, finances to help them. Mm -hmm. So some church adopted us and so we moved into a church for about seven or eight years and uh, we, we, we occupied some empty, I think they gave us two offices and, and all their warehouse. Mm -hmm. And we turned the warehouse into a food pantry and they, they'd come into us and we had hours at least four and a half, four and a half days a week and, and phone calls and they, they could get a hold of us otherwise. Mm -hmm. And so we, we provided food, we provided, uh, we got out of the clothing business. If we could hunt something for them, furniture-wise, we, we, we'd help them with it. And if, if their car broke down, we had somebody that would uh, repair something for them, or, or we could get a discount and, and somebody in the family could change the tire if they mm -hmm. wanted to or whatever they did. So that helped, and we, we helped a little bit with utilities. We didn't have a lot of money, so we had to be careful. So we did those kinds of things. We were there to, to listen, certainly, and uh, and then we had uh, and, and other th we, we we continued some of these other things where we had education, and and we educate educated them on how to fill out your tax reforms and paying bills on time. One woman came into us and she was bankrupt, and 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 they were going to take the house or the car. I, I don't know what it was. They're going to take something. And she was married to a, a lieutenant commander of the United States Navy, and he was in the intelligence unit in Stuttgart, Germany. Uh, boy, we didn't know what to do with that. So uh, a, a local banker said, uh, please refer her to us. We, we, we have a financial a wealth management office, and one of our ladies will coach her and find out what the deal is. Come to find out, she had a checkbook. As long as she had check, uh, the checks in the checkbook, she had money in the bank. The other thing is, she also had a lot of mail. Some of it was open, some of it wasn't. The stuff she knew, maybe it was from a friend or maybe from her husband or something like that, she's opening that. But these other ones, for there were people that were dunning her, and, and, and she was, they were, they were hitting her with, with penalties and all kinds of stuff. She didn't open those. She had a pile of them. So anyway, the lady that talked to her was a professional. So what she did, she took went through all of her stuff mm -hmm. and the personal stuff from hubby gave to her. And then took everything else and, and worked out a schedule to pay it all off. She was, she was getting $7,000 a month in bankrupt. Mm -hmm. So we took that as a key. So then we started offering uh, that kind of orientation and referral mm -hmm. to everybody. Because we figured, I bet you some others out there the same way, well, they might not have $7,000 a month, but it, they got $325 a month or, or $479 a month, and so maybe this would help. We don't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So we started doing that too. And then we started having um, uh, games on, on any place that we have an open space, we, 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 to have some kind of you know, the bounce houses and, 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 and mm -hmm. some cooking and, and, and so they can have a little family get together. We found out we needed to do some things with the, with the units. Uh, that battalion, that battalion commander was in that we told you about mm -hmm. in the armory, his battalion got ready for deployment. 450 guys. And so they went up to uh, Wisconsin. We have, we have a base, a training base up there, and they're up training base for quite some time. Uh, and, and when they got finished with the training, they had a two-week break, and then they would deploy. So when they finished with a two-week break, they needed eight buses to bring them back to Virginia for the two weeks, and then, and then, and then they'd be t driven over to the uh, regional air, air, airport and, and eventually end up in Iraq. Mm -hmm. Kuwait and Iraq, 
So anyway, they had enough, the, the guard had enough money for two buses. So I don't know what happened. Somebody bought a bus, but we bought five. We did, cost $8,000, and we didn't have it. Mm -hmm. So we went around with a tin cup, and we got $8,000. And uh, so they, 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 the bus company went up there, and, 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 and Wisconsin picked them, pick up the rest of the battalion, brought them all back, they're all together, and they worked out an arrangement between themselves, uh, or some, some one of the bus companies, it's a local one, Abbott, was involved with this, and, and so they said, okay, now when you're ready to go to the airport, we'll, we'll pick you up at the armory, take you to where you're going to say goodbye. There was a church that said, we'll help you, mm -hmm. and we'll, we're, we're going to have your farewell. And they provided all the food, and the ladies cooked these really neat things, that, you know, these little finger food things. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, those are great. And those went quick. And, and then and the other things that they made, it, it was really nice, and they brought their families. Can you imagine what 400 plus families, and that, that, was, that was a large group, about 1,200. And they brought in a, <clears throat> a senior ranking general, and uh, I, don't know what he, I, I don't know what he was doing, but it, it, it wasn't a farewell, we love you kind of, I don't know what it was he talking about. Maybe, maybe the new, new, new armored, armored piercing round that they would get. Nobody was interested in it, <laughs> and it, it, it was terrible. But, other, but that was the only thing that was wrong, that, that didn't fit. But everything else was the little, the, the, the community in that church and their surrounding showed up and, and just loved on these people getting ready to leave. So <clears throat> and the guys got under bus and were taken down to the air, airport and, 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 and flew out. And I, I, we, I don't think we paid for that. They, they, somehow they, they did it amongst themselves, mm -hmm. the, the bus company. Uh, talked to the adjutant general at that time, it was a guy by the name of Williams, and he said, when we visited him in his office at Fort Pickett, uh, my executive vice president and myself, uh, and I went to visit him, and he said, we need, we need what you're doing. That battalion commander can't do it without you. And we can't stand at a street corner you all are in civilian clothes. You might have been in the military once, but you're in civilian clothes today. And you can stand out there with a, with a cup and get some money or something, or maybe somebody can volunteer something in kind, whatever it is, and you can help our families. So please keep it up. So we have tried to keep that, that connection, although mm -hmm. they can't advertise us. They can certainly refer to uh, folks to us. Now, in there are some other organizations like Wounded Warrior Project, mm -hmm. that's a, a national organization. John Malin started that some years ago, uh, and uh, he, was a, he was one of our national service officers, helped people to get, get benefits that they, that they earned mm -hmm. when, uh, on, on duty. And he uh, uh, developed that organization and fielded it, uh, first taking backpacks to uh, Walter Reed Hospital up in Washington, D.C. area wanted me to get involved in that. And we were just starting this, and he was just starting his, and his is going to the guys, and ours is going to the family. Mm -hmm. Everybody was wanting to send stuff to the guys, mm -hmm. but not to the families. And so I declined. Uh, he, he eventually moved to Florida, and he's making very well. And uh, all, I get all volunteers except for one, one part-time administrator. Mm -hmm. That's it. Boom. And uh, so he went his way. But when they need food, they come to us. Uh, the state of Virginia, after we got started, and we, we went to some of their meetings in, in Richmond where they're talking about strategies and stuff, uh, about how to work things in, in, the, in, the, in the Commonwealth to include the military. The, uh, the, the, they put some kind of an appeal to the legislature, and they formed a Commonwealth of Virginia Wounded Warrior Program, not Project, Program. Mm -hmm. And what they did, they paid for all the administration to run something that mimics us pretty much. Mm -hmm. uh, not completely though, but pretty much. And, uh, and then so every dollar that was donated to the wounded, the Virginia's Wounded Warrior Program went to the client. Mm -hmm. that's, that's excellent. Yeah. But it's limited. So, anyway, 
over the years, we work with them, we work with uh, the other, other organizations that are available for military and or with their families. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we're involved with all of that, but none of them feed. They, 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 do, they do a variety of things, but for feeding is not, uh, they, they can't sustain that. Mm -hmm. so anyway, moving into current times, uh, in 19, uh, no, in 2015, we had to move out of that church because the youth program was growing so big, and we were enthused with that. We thought that was great. So we closed, we closed our food pantry and gave it all away to the Roanoke County Salem Food Bank. Mm -hmm. It was worth Sixteen. I think it was worth twenty-three thousand one hundred and sixty dollars. Mm -hmm. Wow. Non non perishables. We didn't have anything perishable. Mm -hmm. So we moved out of that and we moved into the Blue Ridge Public Broadcasting Services campus, and we're there today. Mm -hmm. We moved there and, 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 uh, and we opened up in June of 2015, been there ever since. 2016, uh, we decided we would help veterans. We didn't, we didn't focus on the veterans. We just were the active, the people who were actively involved in their guard and reserve mm -hmm. training and or mobilization or deployment for, uh, what is it, disaster, anything. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so, there and then sometimes even even when, when things were they were in, a, in just a training mode something would happen mm -hmm. so we would try to help out there too so that that, that was good so we in, in, invited the veterans in January <clears throat> 2016 uh, we had one or two sessions with 12 families showed up okay by December it was up to 30 families and we so we had about 500 families that we fed in the ballpark, and if, if and we gave them at least seven to ten days worth of food. So I, I, I backed it down and calculated it, if we gave that much food to these families of some of them with three to five persons mm -hmm. in it, and, and we kept the, the data on the adults and the children, uh, we figured out that we fed so many people. 22,000 meals, mm -hmm. and that, that does not include the special things that we did. When, when the headquarters, 29th Division, went to Kuwait in, in uh, October the 30th, 2016, they had no food for the 800 uh, <clears throat> family members that showed up to say goodbye to their loved ones. We paid for that. Mm -hmm. And member one paid 200 thousand we picked up fifty one hundred and we paid for that. That's where I met the governor. <laughs> that that encounter. Okay, so that's fine. So we continued on and came into twenty seventeen. January we had thirty families. August this year we had one hundred and twenty seven families. Oh. We've blown almost ninety thousand dollars and provided for it's approaching now 700 families, and, and we, we, we fed over 30,000 over 30, meals. And we figured by the end of the year, it would be 44,000 meals and 795 families. Uh, so that's where we are right now. And we are stretched. We, did not, we were not prepared for exponential function, functional growth. So we're, 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 we're operating under a thread, okay. as and I is, speak to you. Is this in part because the division headquarters deployed and so you had more, or was it just people learn about you and... Word of mouth. Yeah, and so the network just expands. We, we, we have two things that are causing it. First of all, there are more better veterans than active folks. Mm -hmm. Act, somebody that's actively involved in a guard reserve or an active unit active duty full-time mm -hmm. unit, that, that was the active community. Right. Okay, that, 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 that was 
in, in Commonwealth of Virginia have been maybe 8,000. Veterans are yeah. half a million plus. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, we're getting that. And, uh, and that's just touching the folks that are here in Royal Valley mm -hmm. and the five counties around us, primarily. And then, and then, and then it leaks mm -hmm. after that because we're still touching the other people that come in. But, um, so that's where we are. And so what we're trying, we're, we're really struggling to, we don't have a grant writer. I mean, I scribbled a couple of things and one of them hit. Another one was just kind of small, yeah, but I got one big one that helped us. That's the only reason we're through. And it's kind of neat. People give us stuff, mm -hmm. and I've got over ten thousand dollars of in-kind stuff, and I'm, I'm still picking up stuff. Mm -hmm. that, that, that by the end of the year, it should be fifteen to twenty thousand dollars in-kind. Once you get in, it's gone. Mm -hmm. And still, in my budget, we have everything's automated now. I got, I got, I got an accountant. That, Amazon, I don't pay them much. Mm -hmm. But what, what happens is when I when I make an entry, I send them I send them reports monthly about what I I think we did money in money mm -hmm. out. The bank sends them a report and he computerizes the whole thing, mm -hmm. hits some magic buttons, and it produces a budget. I have overspent twenty six thousand dollars, and yet I got no bills outstanding. Now, how do you fix that? It's paper. Mm -hmm. You can live on that, but the thing is, what you need to do is have some funds come in because this exponential function hasn't stopped. Mm -hmm. And so, if I run out of in kind, I, I have I have twelve thousand dollars in hip pocket. That's all I got left now, mm -hmm. out of a bunch. Mm -hmm. I have fifty five thousand in 2016. Mm -hmm. We burned it up mm -hmm. in twenty seventeen. <laughs> but. The idea is keep the faith, mm -hmm. and uh, some folks, and, and we're, we're trying to, I'm bringing a sergeant first class who was my, my first administrator, she's still in an active mm -hmm. reserve unit, so I'm hoping she'll uh, be able to get glib and write in grants. Mm -hmm. So that's where we are. So all this stuff in the background is, is, is developing an environment for a family, and, and where the military can't, they have no, legally they can't, they, 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 they can't stand at, stand at a, a street corner and tent some biddle in New York City with a tin cup so we get enough money to buy a new B-52. You can't mm -hmm. do that. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to buy a new B-52 uh, locally. All right. Well, it, it makes for a really pretty remarkable story overall with a lot of different pieces that interconnect in a lot of very interesting ways. So I'd just like to close here by thanking you for taking all this time out of your reunion visit here uh, to share that story with us.